ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Jill Chenault. <laughs> My mother is a very nice person. And I'm not just saying that because she's my mother, it's a fact. My mother taught my sister and I how to knit and crochet and bake cookies and make paper dolls. My mother is just a sweet, nice person. She made us a puppet stage when I was about maybe five or six. She had no experience designing or making anything, but she made this puppet stage complete with velvet curtains and hand-painted detail, and it was the bomb. <laughs> then she taught us how to make paper mache puppets, and she sat through many a terrible puppet show. But that's my mother, she's, she's that kind of person. And she wasn't just nice to us. My mother forged her friend Osi's husband's name to many a bank document. <laughs> it's bank fraud. Back then, the teacher's credit union would not allow a female teacher who was married to borrow money from the credit union without her husband's signature. So my mother would sign on Osi's husband's name, and on Osi did the same thing for my mother. They said, ain't neither one of them men taught nary a child. They didn't have any business in their business with the credit union. <laughs> And Osi was her girl, so that's what she did. In the early 70s, my Aunt Shirley had a massive stroke, and she was in a coma for a long time, for weeks. My mother didn't listen to the doctors. She talked to Aunt Shirley, she read to her, she painted her nails until the nurses made her stop. And when Aunt Shirley finally woke up, cussing and pulling out tubes, my mother helped her learn how to crawl, then walk, then learn the alphabet, then write because that was her sister, and that's what my mother does. She's a very kind, sweet person. She's a retired teacher, my mom. First and second grade, she used to make pinatas for her classrooms, and she would fill them up with candy and toys that she bought with her own money. She would keep food on hand in her classroom, or sometimes just bring it from home, for kids who she suspected weren't getting enough to eat at home. And when she had children that didn't behave in school, she would bring them home with her, bring them home for dinner. She made us play with them. <laughs> and when she took them home after dinner, she would invite them to choose a toy to take home with them. <laughs> Our toys. <laughs> but that's my mother. She's just a really, really nice person. When her friend Arlene had cancer, my mother fought that fight with her for 15 years, and she cooked food for Arlene's family regularly and just took it over there. When Arlene was too sick to get off the kitchen floor, my mother lay down on the floor with her. That's the kind of person she is. My mother can love or pray you out of a coma or cancer. And when kids teased me about having buck teeth and I would cry, my mother held me on her lap and said, just ignore them. And every once in a while, she'd stop what she was doing and just look at me and say, you're a pretty little girl, as if she just noticed it. And we both knew she was lying. <laughs> I could barely close my lips around all those teeth, but my mother wanted me to feel good and to feel pretty and just be patient until she could get me to an orthodontist. <laughs> now, there's a side to my mother that most people never see. My mother can cuss you out so bad <laughs> that she will singe off your eyebrows and your eyelashes. <laughs> she would also discipline us with these mysterious kind of confusing commands and statements. I remember when I bounced a ball in the house, my mother said to me, if you don't stop that, you better. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> but I knew I should stop. When my sister and I would run around playing with the other kids after church while the adults were socializing, my mother would say, you better get someplace and sit down. And grown men started looking around for a seat. <laughs> my mother was very, very nice, but she was stern. I remember the dreaded J.L. Hudson's incident. My sister had run off and my mother couldn't find her. 
and she was crying and running through the store searching and a sales lady jumped in to help her and then my sister jumped out from a circular rack of clothes and said boo and started laughing and while the ooh from boo was still kind of hanging in the air my mother snatched her up with one arm and wore her little behind out right there in J.L. Hudson's. She finally did put her down, but I have to tell you, my mother remains the queen of the one arm snatch up. She could snatch up a 55 pound child and beat that child within an inch of its life and never break a sweat. And she didn't care where you were. You could be in church, you could be in Hudson's. Well, my mother put her down. She wiped her eyes, my mother fixed her hair. And then she snatched her back up again. And she landed a few more before the sales lady finally said, uh, ma'am, I think that's enough. On the way home, my mother was driving and growling at my sister Stephanie the whole way. Don't you ever run off and do nothing like that again, scaring me like that, I swear to God. I will be on you like we the people you ever do some foolishness like that again. Talking about boo, I'll give you some boo. <laughs> I'll be damned. It was, it was scary, but she, I knew she was really nice, though. I knew, I, I remember the puppet stage and everything. She was nice. <laughs> the day that my mother tried to kill my sister Stephanie <laughs> is a day that lives in infamy. Stephanie had stolen my mother's paycheck out of her purse and went to the bus station to try to leave town. <laughs> My mother and father brought her back from the bus station. My father was just beside himself, and my mother said, please, just leave me alone with her. I want to talk to her alone. <laughs> I was eavesdropping, and I couldn't make out exactly what was said. I still don't know what Stephanie said that triggered this, but I heard the screams for help. <laughs> I ran in and found my mother on top of Stephanie, choking her and slamming her head on the floor and saying, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. And I managed to get her off, but I was scared and I wasn't even involved. I was just vicariously scared. And I wondered how could the nice, sweet puppet stage mommy just flip a switch and, and try to kill her firstborn child? But she, she really was trying to kill her. And I thought, I, I will never be this mommy, gangster mommy. When I grow up, I'm gonna be puppet stage mommy. Because she, she was just scary. Well, I realized that I really never knew my mother's mother or my mother's grandmother. And I thought, well, that might have something to do with it. But I didn't know them. And so I didn't really think much of it at all when I was a little kid. I did know that we spent a lot of time at my great-grandmother's house long after my great-grandmother was dead. 146 Jackson Street in Pontiac. All family events that were big were celebrated or mourned at 146. We even had the birthday party for my grandmother and her twin brother, Uncle Buddy. Long after they were dead, we kept having that party. <laughs> we did. New Year's Day. And everybody in our family had lived at 146 at one time or another. Everybody of my mother's generation or older. It was the family hub. And that was just where we spent a great deal of time. Toward the end, only my great aunts, Maribel and Hortense, lived there. But I remember lots of great family dinners there. And after dinner, we kids would beg my mother and Aunt Betty, tell us the story about the crazy man in Mississippi. And my mother and Aunt Betty would first, they'd refuse and we'd beg some more. And then finally, they would start the story. It always started the same way. Austin Riddick was black as coal and mean as a snake. He was mean, but he was really, really smart. And he used to beat his wife. And then he beat their children. Until one day his wife put him at the business end of a shotgun and invited him to leave. He left. But he kept writing ugly, threatening letters to his wife and to his kids. Even when the kids were grown. Even when everybody else had moved north except him. He continued to write these horrible letters to his wife and children. Well, there came a time when he lost all of his money in the stock market. And he traveled to his wife's house and demanded money from her and their grown kids. He said, we're still family. I need you. Well, they refused. And he acted so ugly that they had to call the police. And Austin Riddick was dragged off to jail. So the crazy man was locked up. He was locked up for 30 days. 
When he got out, he went back to that house. He hid in the shed behind the house until dark. And then he broke in through a basement window. Now, the only people in the house were his wife, his adult daughter, and her two babies, one year old and three years old. And everybody was sleeping. By the time it was over, the crazy man from Mississippi had bludgeoned everybody in that house. When he realized what he had done, he stabbed himself in the chest repeatedly, and he died in the backyard. As I got older, I started to question that story a little bit. <laughs> I think I was in college when I said to my mother one day, do you really think he killed himself? You think maybe they killed him when they found what he had done to those babies? And my mother looked at me and said, don't you ever ask me that again, gangster mommy. <laughs> so I let it go. Now, everybody that was bludgeoned in that house lived. Everybody. He was the only one who ended up dead. There were some severe injuries, but everybody else lived. Well, one day, I think I was probably in college, I said, wait a minute, Austin Riddick, that's Ann Hortense's last name. And my mother said, why are we spending all this money on your education? Of course, that is Ann Hortense's last name. <laughs> Austin Riddick was her father, my mother's father, and my grandfather. Who the hell did you think we were talking about all this time? Well, I, I didn't know, and I was shocked. So I continued, I said, well, then why would she stay in that house? Why would, would your grandmother, my great-grandma, stay in that house after such a terrible thing happened. I mean, that means that every time you told us the story, the people that you were talking about were in the room with us when you were telling the story. And we're sitting in the house where it happened. And we've played in that yard. I've done cartwheels in that yard where he died. And my mother said, well, my grandmother said that she had cleaned too many white folks' toilets to let some crazy nigga drive her out of her house. And then my mother went back to eating her pound cake and ice cream. <laughs> well, I went on to become a criminal defense attorney. And I did a lot of trials, assault, homicide. So I had to learn about the amount of force that it would take for someone to drive a knife into a grown man's chest, let alone do it repeatedly. And I had persistent doubts about the story, but I was still scared of gangster mama. <laughs> so I let it go. There came a time when we had to sell 146 because nobody else was willing to live in the house. Aunt Hortense and Aunt Maribel could no longer live there by themselves. So we went to the house to clean it out. So we're cleaning out the house, and I'm finding letters everywhere in hat boxes, shoe boxes, kitchen drawers, coffee cans, all over the house. And I find one letter, and I read it, and it was my favorite letter. It's still my favorite letter. It was from my grandmother to her sister Maribel's mother-in-law. Maribel had married somebody named Chester, and apparently it didn't work out. Aunt Maribel said that he was a mama's boy and was weak, and so she had moved back to 146. Well, Chester's sisters and his mother were writing all kinds of insulting letters to Maribel. And my grandmother finally said, look, I got to step in and write this letter. And she wrote the letter to Chester's mom in nice language, beautiful script, and she laid that lady out. She talked about her, her family, her husband, her son, everybody. Just laid him out. The lady probably didn't even know she was bleeding <laughs> until after she was cut. But that's what my grandmother did. And toward the end of the letter, she said, were it not for the restrictions in the United States Post Office, I could better express myself. <laughs> or better still, face to face. So I read the letter out loud to my family. We took a break in the cleaning of the house. And my uncle Alvin, bless his heart, he said, well, no wonder y'all are like you are. You can't help it. I mean, listen to that. You're just the, you got the big hands, you got the big feet, you got the sharp tongue. You just like her. It's genetic. <laughs> well, I was horrified because I was going to be puppet stage mommy. I wasn't going to be <laughs> like that. I wasn't going to be gangster mommy. I was destined to be puppet stage mommy. My Aunt Betty said to Uncle Alvin, shut the hell up and get back to work. <laughs> so we did. Well into my practice, Aunt Betty, if she wasn't cussing, she didn't love you. Well into my practice, I finally worked up the nerve 
to try to get more information. So I went to the county clerk's office and I had them pull Austin Riddick's death certificate. In the space marked cause of death, it said throat slit with razor. So I called my mother <laughs> and I told her what this form said and I also mailed her a copy but immediately I called her and I told her what the form said and by then my niece Taylor had been born and my mother was a doting grandmother and I said to her, don't you think now that you're a grandmother and you love this baby that if you found that someone had struck her with an axe and you could get your hands on him, don't you think you're killing? And my mother was silent. Then she said, all I knew was what they told us. This happened before I was born. I knew my grandmother to be a nice person. She was nice and she was sweet. I thought, nice? <laughs> sweet? That sounds like puppet stage mommy before she flips the switch and turns into gangster mommy. Maybe Uncle Al was onto something. I don't know. What? Over the years, I thought a lot about what Uncle Al had said and about puppet stage mommy, gangster mommy. And I thought about all the times I'd had to cuss somebody out. <laughs> all the times that friends had called me with difficult situations and we handled it either at night in hoodies with a baseball bat <laughs> or in the light of day wearing a suit. We handled things. And I thought, well, I, I thought that being ride or die was good. That's not the same as gangster mommy. That's, no, that's different. That's different. Well, ultimately, I ended up living in New York. I was there for 14 years. And after my first or second year there, my father was diagnosed with a rare form of MS. But my mother said, don't come home. We're fine. We got it. I got this. We're fine. Well, early this year, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's also. And I started to hear through friends and family that my mother was looking more and more tired. When I saw her at Christmas, she looked exhausted. And so a couple of months ago, I moved back home to my parents' house in Lansing. I hadn't lived there since Jimmy Carter was president. <laughs> I thought the hard part was going to be getting used to living in Lansing. Really, the hard part was living with my mother. Within 24 hours, she had cussed me out. She was dissatisfied with everything I did for the first couple of weeks. I didn't do the laundry right. The coffee was too strong. What was I going to do with my hair? Was I going out of the house with my hair like that? <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was confused. I was hurt. I came home to help. And she was nicer to me when I was gone than when I was back in the house trying to help. Well, things finally came to a head one day when she was getting on me about Rite Aid. You better get to Rite Aid right now. Don't let them close like you did yesterday. But when I was trying to defend myself, she said, look, just, just go. I don't know what the hell to say to you. I, don't know, I just don't know what the hell you want from me. What the hell do you want from me? And that's when I said to my 82-year-old mother, shut the fuck up. <laughs> now, my mother is not your average 82-year-old. She started going to the gym when she was in her 70s. And she called me in New York and said, I can leg press 400 pounds. I said, Mama, you can't leg press 400 pounds. I mean, that's, that's just, you, you don't understand what it means. When you say you can press something, that means you can do it consistently. You can do sets. You can, maybe you can lift 400 pounds once. But, and before I could finish, she said, girl, don't you tell me. I know what I can do. You ain't got the sense God gave a goose's ass. I can lift. 400 pounds with my legs, I can do two sets of eight. And I heard my father in the background saying, see, I told you I was scared of her. <laughs> and now y'all know why. So when I said, shut the fuck up, to my mother, I said it as I was walking backwards quickly toward the door. <laughs> and I left the house, I didn't come back until I knew that she was asleep. And in the morning, I did not come out of my room until I knew she had gone to play bridge. I finally tipped downstairs and my father was down there waiting for me, sitting on his walker. And he said to me, sit down. And I thought, oh no. But then he didn't look angry. He said, your mother and I love you very much and we're glad you're home. Your mother works very hard to take care of me 
to take care of this house, keep the house running. She's been doing all of this by herself. And I have not been the best husband. If it weren't for your mother, I'd have been dead a long time ago. I know she can be rigid, but just relax and understand that she's not used to having another grown woman living in her house. You're trying to fit into her system. So just be patient. You are your mother's child. What? <laughs> I was horrified, but I couldn't say that because he has dementia, he's my father, he's sitting on his walker. So I just said, okay, fine. But I did think about what he said a lot in the coming days after that. My mother and I reached an uneasy truce for a while, and now we're close like we had been before. I've realized that even though I didn't know my grandmother and my great-grandmother, I know my mother. I am my mother's child. All those times when I was ride or die, when I was saying, he did what? I'll be right there. <laughs> that was my great-grandmother insisting on living in her house. That was my grandmother helping her mother clean the blood out of those carpets so we could keep living in that house. That was my mother trying to choke my sister and telling me that I was pretty when we knew that I wasn't. Now I embrace being gangster mommy. I'm sure I could build a puppet stage, but I am my mother's child. I'm very proud to be a Riddick woman, and I thank all of them that came before me for giving me this strength. Thank you. Jill Chenault, Jill Chenault.